Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand. You want to be standing on your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come. Let it live in me. This is my prayer. This is my plea. Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side. Hi, I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries, and today we are going to dive into um, a difficult, complex, but over time you'll see how simple of a topic uh, we're going we're gonna to get into today really is. Uh, we are going to uh, talk about a series that's entitled The Great Church Audit. Um, and uh, so my question right off the bat is, when was the last time that the church actually had an audit? Maybe 500 years ago with Martin Luther. Well, now is the time, uh, I believe, in these last days that God is calling his people to audit exactly uh, what uh, they believe, why they believe, and, uh, and ultimately what we believe is going to determine how we live our life. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask you a couple uh, of, of requests before we get started. Uh, this is actually a three DVD or a three part series in this DVD series. Uh, the first one is called What is Sin? And we're going to talk about that today. That'll be the first part in the series. The second one is What is the New Covenant? And the third one is The Difficult Sayings of Paul. As we walk through uh, today's topic of what is sin, uh, it sounds like a simple question. Uh, but as we begin to dive into the scriptures and let the scriptures define the scriptures, what we're going to find out is that man's fingerprints, once again, has uh, made itself into the little crevices of our theology and uh, needs to be tweaked just a little bit. And in that tweaking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to keep an open mind. Because as we let the Bible actually define itself, uh, some of the conclusions that we come to might actually rub against what you currently believe or your current theology. So don't get too far ahead as we work through the scriptures and, and try to draw conclusions. This is just the first part in this series or the first part of this journey. So what we're going to try to answer the ultimate question is, is, is the law of God or is the commandments of God or is the covenant of God that was given on Mount Sinai, is that done away with? Has it been abolished? Have we committed uh, indirectly high treason against the king and not even known it? So without further ado, let's get started and uh, we'll begin to work through the scriptures. The first question is, are we in violation of the king's law? Like I said before, we're going to deal with what is sin, what is the new covenant, and ultimately the difficult sayings of Paul. And I think many of you will admit with me that much of what Paul says is kind of hard to understand. I'm going to submit to you that in that series, when we get there, you're going to find out that the reason why a lot of what Paul has to say is difficult to understand is because we're looking at it from the wrong perspective. We're looking at it from our perspective and not from his. The power of a definition how many of you know that how one defines sin is directly related to how you will live your life? How you live your life is directly related to what you believe. Whatever you believe is sin, you will naturally condemn. So if you believe that uh, uh, homosexuality is wrong, then you're going to condemn that. If you believe that abortion is wrong, then you are going to condemn that. You will not condemn something if you don't believe it's wrong. So I want to submit to you that what you actually believe is incredibly important because you're already doing what you believe in, okay? What you believe, if you believe something is not sin, you will naturally support it. So what we're going to try to do in answering this question of what sin is, is that we want to make sure that when we stand before God at the end of time, that our definition of sin is exactly what his definition of sin is, okay? Before we actually let the scriptures tell us what sin is, let's walk through uh, the internet for a moment. Most of us use the internet for a lot of different things, but let's, let's find out exactly uh, what our culture says sin is if you were to do a cursory uh, research, a Google search, if you will, on sin. Some of the web definitions that I found were estrangement from God, 
an act that is regarded by theologians as a transgression of God's will. Wikipedia says, sin is a term used mainly in a religious context to describe an act that violates a moral rule or the state of having committed such a violation. Commonly, the moral code of conduct is decreed by a divine entity. Now, I, I want to mention there, Wikipedia says, commonly, that is defined by a divine entity. That means that every once in a while, uh, a non-divine entity can actually begin to define what that sin is. And so what we want to do again is we want to make sure that what our definition of sin is is exactly what his definition of sin is. And why is that so important? I'll tell you why, how critical this is. Is because we do not want to be offending God and not know it. We don't want to be like the Israelites that find themselves at the base of Mount Sinai. Remember when the, at the base of Mount Sinai, Moses goes up on the mountain. He's there for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? And uh, he never comes back, so they think. And so what do they decide to do? Now, they come from a culture that, is, that, that, that has gods and goddesses for everything, and they create idols uh, as mediators between the gods and them. And so Moses became their mediator between them and Yahweh. Well, when Moses took off and didn't come back, they needed a new mediator. And so, contrary to what a lot of us have been taught about the golden calf, they were not worshiping another god from their perspective. There is a disagreement in the scriptures, I'm going to bring that out in just a moment, all this for a point, of how critical it is to make sure that we define sin from the perspective of God, Yahweh. It says in the text that Aaron says, tomorrow we're going to have a feast to Yahweh. You see, from their perspective, all they did was replace Moses. And they had come from the traditions and doctrines of men in Egypt. And so they took upon themselves the background and their culture, and they created a system, a new mediator, or a new sacrificial system, if you will, to bring before their new God. Now, the problem is, is that from their perspective, everything was fine and hunky-dory and everything was going in the right direction. But from God's perspective, what did Yahweh speak to Moses when he was on the mountain? He said, wait a minute, I hear some noise. Moses, you need to go back down the mountain because the people are serving other gods. They're worshiping another god. Now, as you see, that's where we get it in the text and where we all grew up in our Bible stories, uh, Sunday school, that, that the people were worshiping other gods. And that's why God got so upset. But that is not the case, my friends. It was from Yahweh's perspective that they were worshiping another god. From the Israelites' perspective, they were not. You see, God had defined sin one way. The people defined it another way. That's the criticalness because 3,000 people died on that day. And so why we're going through this, and it might seem a silly question to ask of what is sin. Doesn't everybody know what sin is? Well, no. Nobody, we don't all know what sin is or everyone would not be doing the same thing. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. And I'm going to submit to you it's because that we have far moved away from the biblical definition of sin. Okay? Webster's Dictionary. Webster's Dictionary says, an offense against religious or moral law, an action that is felt to be highly reprehensible, an often serious shortcoming, a transgression of the law of God, a vitiated state of human nature in which the self is estranged from God. Let's, let's work through a few scriptures uh, here in the New Testament, some very popular scriptures on sin. Number one, Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 3.23, virtually everyone has heard of this verse. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, how we define sin is going to be directly proportionate to what we get out of this verse. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin, or the penalty of sin, is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Now, we have talked about these verses our whole life in, in sharing the gospel with people. But I'm going to ask the question, what does sin actually mean? When Paul wrote these scriptures in Romans 3 and Romans 6, what was in his mind? What did he mean when he said, the wages of sin is death and all have sinned? How we define sin is going to be exactly what we pull out of that verse. And what we pull out of that verse is ultimately how we're going to live our life. So we need a teacher's aid. Wouldn't you agree? 
If we're going to define any word in any language, what would be a valuable book to use to help define that word? Well, I hope you said a dictionary, because that's exactly what we need, is a dictionary. Now, here's the real question. Should we use a Zondervan Bible Dictionary, the Anchor Bible Dictionary, or the Harper's Bible Dictionary? There's lots of dictionaries out there that we can use. We need to find out exactly which dictionary that we should use. Should you pull one off your shelf? That's our first inclination, isn't it? Should we call our pastor? Should we, should we do this? Should we do that? Should we do a Google search on what sin is? I'm going to submit to you all throughout this teaching that there is only one single document that you really need to understand the scriptures, and that is the scriptures. There's a reason why there's 66 of them. There's a reason why there's, there's thousands and thousands upon thousands of verses in the scriptures, why he emphasizes over and over again the same topic because he wants to give us context and help us understand that we don't have to go anywhere else. All we need to do is let the scriptures through the Spirit show us what it says and we'll get the exact definition. Watch this. If we're not going to use any of those, uh, def those dictionaries, then what should we use? Well, what if I told you that archaeologists have found a first century Bible dictionary that totally, completely, from A to Z, details every single biblical word definition found in the Bible? Would you believe me? Do you know what they call it? They actually did find this. It's called the Tanakh, or the Old Testament. That is the Bible dictionary that we need to use. So if we want to know how the New Testament writers define the words that they wrote, then we have to use the only book of reference and dictionary that they had at the time. Remember, in the New Testament, there is no New Testament and no Christianity when the Hebrew Scriptures were written. When they were penned, what we, we would later called Scripture or the New Testament, there was no New Testament and there was no church. So in the New Testament, or in our, in our Bible studies, and as we begin to walk through the scriptures and try to understand them, it is a critical hermeneutical rule of interpreting scriptures that we understand this one rule, that we cannot use the New Testament to interpret the New Testament, because it didn't exist. Paul, when he was writing, writing Romans, uh, did not quote from Timothy as scripture, okay? When he was writing the book of Romans, he quoted from one source, in one source only, and that's the only dictionary that he had available to him, which was the Old Testament. So it would behoove us as believers that if we're going to understand doctrine, if we're going to understand theology, if we want to learn how to live our lives, we need to use the same dictionary that the disciples used or the apostles used when they wrote the scriptures. Would you agree? So let's go back to the beginning, because the beginning is where we're going to find our answers. Daniel 9.11 says this, Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. See, what we're doing here, guys, is we're letting the Old Testament describe what sin is. So we're going to go back to the Bible dictionary and we're going to find out exactly what uh, the Old Testament says what their dictionary said. Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come like an angel against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. So what is the Old Testament definition of sin? It's very simple. It is the breaking of God's law. That's the definition that they had from the very beginning of time when the New Testament writers were penning their, what would later be called the New Testament scriptures, their definition, the framework of their mind, remember, all of these New Testament writers are Jewish. They all come from a Hebraic mindset. So we would do well that if we're going to understand the same scriptures that they wrote, that we would have that same Hebraic mindset as well. Uh, so what, uh, as we work through these scriptures, remember, what we're doing is we're taking the glasses of Western Greco-Roman society and 21st century theology, and we're just going to put them aside for a moment and put on the glasses that Paul and Timothy and John and Luke and all of them had. And those glasses were Hebraic. Okay? And if you were to go to the first century and ask any little Jewish boy what sin was, 
he would tell you it's the breaking of God's law. So now that we know exactly what the Old Testament has to say about what, what sin is, let's move to the New Testament and see if we see any different interpretation. Romans 3.20 says this, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So right here, what we have is we have a New Testament scripture that is detailing for us exactly what sin is and what it does. It brings to us the knowledge that we've broken God's commandments. If we, right here, Paul says in Romans 3.20 that the law tells you when you're in sin. The law brings the knowledge of sin. Let's reverse that. A lot of times, if you want to understand Scripture, we can reverse it, and it'll, it'll, it'll extrapolate for you a little deeper meaning. That means that without the law, there is no knowledge of sin. Okay? Right here, we have a problem in our Christian thinking. Because our Christian thinking, or most of our theology that we've been brought up with, says that the law of God has been done away with. That the Old Covenant is old, you see? And, and our definition of old... Uh, means that uh, new is better. Out with the old, in with the new, right? The only uh, people that see value in something that's old are people that uh, you know, collect artifacts. Or if you're a garage sailor, if you, if you go garage sailing, then you definitely see the value in something that's old. Uh, and that's what we want to do right here in the scriptures. We want to bring value. We want to put the Old Testament and the New Testament together and make sure that the definitions that are given are exactly what the disciples uh, had in mind. And their definition uh, of sin, you can only be found in the law. Romans 7, 8 says, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Let's take a moment for a second and just and digress about that. Is that what, what he's saying is if you take away the law of God, you have no ability to know what sin is. Sin is dead because it has no opportunity to condemn you. If you remove the law, you remove the power of the law over you to condemn you. Now, a cursory a thought that you might have, well, that's a good thing. We don't want the law to curse us. Well, my friends, if we don't have a curse, we don't need a savior. That's how critical this issue is. 1 Corinthians 15.56 says this, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. What does that mean? Very simply, that sin has no definition outside of the law. The strength of sin is the law itself. You remove the law, there is no sin. Sin has no power. Because sin's power over man is because the law defines exactly what it is. James 2.9 the president of the Council of Jerusalem says this, the brother of Yeshua, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now that is a direct quote from Leviticus 19.15. He's saying the same exact thing that he said in the, New Testament, in the Old Testament is being said in the New Testament. That sin is a transgression of God's law. And we'll move to probably the most powerful, very clear, articulate verse in the New Testament that is undisputed, uh, heavyweight champion of the New Testament, so to speak, that lines up directly with the Old Testament is 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. It says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of God's law. Now, can we have any, any more um, clear definition of exactly what sin is? It's the, trans, it's, the, it's the breaking of God's law. Sin is the breaking of God's law. So with this in mind, this is going to be a, a little fun course here, but be very intriguing. We're going to go back through some of our favorite verses in the New Testament, and we're going to take off our Greco-Roman Christian mindset of exactly what sin is, and we're going to read the verses as if sin is actually breaking of the commandments. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says this. What shall we say then? Remember, we just read this verse a little earlier. Shall we continue in breaking the law that grace may abound? Now, many of us have been told that uh, growing up in our Christian circles that we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. Well, here's a question. Did Paul mean right here in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, 
that we are no longer have to keep God's law. You can break God's law because grace will abound. Well, right here, he details for us that, that we shall not continue breaking the law or sin so that grace may abound. You see the difference? When you define sin as some ambiguous uh, you know, uh, philosophy, philosophical thought of you know, breaking the uh, moral code or breaking society's code of conduct uh, or such a thing, what you do is you remove the power and the very clear interpretation of the scriptures. They just ever so slightly move to the left. You give it 2,000 years of history and the entire scriptures become liberal. They become very left. They move strongly to the left because they slowly have been turning to the left over time. If you go back and redefine the scriptures the way the authors actually define it, which is by the dictionary that they had, what you find is we shall not continue breaking the law. And my friends, the only law in the New Testament was the law of God in the Old Testament. Romans 6.15 says... What, shall, uh, what then? Shall we sin, break the law, because we are not under the penalty of the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Probably one of the most uh, misunderstood scriptures uh, of the day is right here in Romans chapter 6. It says, be, shall we continue to sin because we're not under law, we're under grace? We have defined that, my friends, as lawlessness. That we are not under the jurisdiction of the law any longer. We do not have to keep God's commandments. There are no instructions for life outside of what we find in the New Testament. We're under grace. As if grace, the definition of grace, is liberty to sin. May it never be, uh, Romans 6 says. Romans 6, 1 says, we shall not continue to break the law just because we're under grace. Matter of fact, he says, the question is, what then? Shall we break the law because we're not under its penalty anymore? No, we are under grace. That's what he's saying. You see, the law only came to do three things, and you're going to find out what that is in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, let's move to Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin, the wages of breaking God's law is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see how that changes the connotation, uh, uh, the meaning of the verse just ever so slightly, is when you actually define it, as breaking God's law, which is what the definition is, 1 John 3, 4, then what we have is the wages of breaking the commandments is death. Have you ever wondered why we're condemned to death anyway? Why we even needed a Savior? You know, we go around and we, and we uh, evangelize and we tell people about the Messiah and, and we say, you need to know Jesus. Well, that's great. And, we, and they say, well, why do I need to know Jesus? And our first, uh, our first inclination is to say, because you're sinned. You've sinned. Well, here's the question. When we actually tell them that the reason why they need a Savior is because they sin, do we really understand what we're saying is the reason why you need a Savior is because you broke the commandments of God. And the law says that you must die. So unless you want to die, you need a Savior to save you from the death that is due to you for breaking the law that was given so long ago. So the breakdown, this is how it works. The law was given to the entire world through his people Israel that were to be a light to the nations. Remember, Israel was, was a people that were called out by God. They were called out by God and their job was to be a light to the nations. Does that sound uh, familiar at all? Uh, does that sound familiar in the New Testament when Jesus says that, that he is a light to the nations? Remember when he says that you are the light to the world? That a city on a hill cannot be hit? Do you think by any chance that these young Jewish boys that grew up learning the commandments, they knew that Israel was a chosen people. They knew that they were chosen to be a light to the nations. He wasn't telling them anything new. He was bringing to their remembrance their very God-given purpose in life which is to take the instructions that he gave Adam, that he gave to Noah, that he passed on down to Abraham, and then he finally gave it to Moses and he wrote it in stone so that we wouldn't forgive it, forget it. That he finally came in person and said, this is how I want you to keep it. I want you to take my law, my commandments, and take the gospel message that now anybody can come into my kingdom and be part of my people Israel. 
through the Spirit and through the faith and the trust in, my, in me, the Son of God. That is the gospel. That is being a light to the nations. He was simply continuing the very message that he gave their forefathers when they dropped the ball. Secondly, the law of God was never intended just for Israel. The entire world is under its jurisdiction. Let's just look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. There's that term again, that misunderstood term. So that every mouth may be shut and all the world may be guilty before God. You see, Paul is telling us right here that the entire world is subject to the law of God. The entire world is subject to the law of God. It's not just Israel. It's not just the Jewish people. It's the entire world. Everyone is, falls underneath the jurisdiction. Everyone has broken his law and has fallen short of his glory. Romans 3.23 the wages of breaking Yahweh's law is death. We know this. We're just not putting two to two together that the reason why we die is because we broke the commandments. Now here's the question. Why do we die? Why is it that the breaking of God's law is death? Why is it that the very thing that, that, that was supposed to be given for life became death to us, as Paul says. You see, because Paul talks about the law, sometimes in a negative way, we take it that the entire law of God is negative, that it's a curse, that it's evil. No, what he's actually doing is he is giving us a very good definition of exactly what the law does. So on our next slide, what we're going to show you is what the law actually does. It only does three things. Number one, it blesses us when we keep it. Deuteronomy 11.26 says that. I set before you blessings and curses. Number two, it curses you when you break it. When we break it, it curses us. That's what it's designed to do. And thirdly, it defines what sin is. 1 John 3.4, for sin is the transgression of the law. Deuteronomy 11.26 says this, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. And my friends, that was not just for Israel. That was for all of us. Okay? It was for the entire world. That when you sin and you break God's law, you deserve death. Now remember, the law is a static document. The only person that can change it is the one that wrote it. Okay? We cannot get in there and change and say, well, we don't like this and we don't like that because that's exactly what our forefathers did. That's exactly what the Israelites did. On Mount Sinai, when the written word was, was given, when the word of God was given, the spirit was also supposed to be given. Remember, they decided against that plan. They wanted Moses to go up. They wanted a king. They didn't want to be priests of a living God and have a personal relationship you see, only half, I must submit to you that only half of the Word of God was given on Mount Sinai. It was the written instructions. But how many of you realize that if you give a child, an eight-year-old, a book on math and just say, here's the, the instruction manual, it's going to be very difficult for him to uh, or her to implement that into their life without a teacher, without a helper, you see. But they didn't want the helper. They didn't want a personal relationship. They wanted to figure it out on their own. They wanted someone to rule over them. And so God gave them exactly what they wanted. And 1,200 years later, the day of Pentecost came a second time. Except this time, they were ready. And they wanted it. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them on the Feast of Shavuot and fulfilled what they should have received all the way back on the Mount Sinai on the day of Pentecost on, on the first time. So together, they had both the spirit now and the truth. And they walked in it. And that's why there was power. You see, the law only does three things. It defines what sin is, it curses us, and it blesses us. Certainly, we can't possibly say that if you're nice to your spouse, or if you, you're good to your kids, and you bring them up in a good way, that there's not blessings. Where do you think those blessings are coming from? They're coming from the very thing that we call the Messiah, Yeshua. Jesus, and we call him the Word made flesh. 
Well, in the first century, when John said the Word became flesh, what was his definition of Word? It was the Torah, the instructions for life, the very thing that was called the way, the truth, and the life in the Old Testament. It was called the sect of the way in the New Testament. Why? Because Jesus, when he, when he tore open his, his, his robe of who he really was, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The reason why the, 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 the rabbis and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people shook in disbelief and were just shocked is because they knew what the way, the truth, and the life really was. It was the Torah that they grew up with. And what this man, which the Rabbi Yeshua was calling himself, was the living Torah, the living instruction manual for life. That he, after he would die, would send the helper, the teacher's aid, to teach us how to live. So the law, as Galatians says, is unto Christ. Absolutely. It has no more authority over us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see how that works? We look at it as the law is here. Or excuse me. Uh, yeah, the law is here. Christ is here. Unto means not existing afterwards. But the whole context is talking about authority. The law has no authority to condemn the Messiah. There's a new sheriff in town. He's the one that decides who stays and who goes. And if you're in him, then you're forgiven. Let's move on. So we broke the law and we all deserve to die. We know that. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. The law itself is not the problem. It is the curse upon all mankind because of our disobedience. Romans 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. Let's stop for just a moment and, disc and, and go over Romans chapter 7 for just a second. We've all, you know, we, everyone knows what Romans 7 says. The things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do want to do, and I don't, I don't want to do, and I do. Right? But what's strikingly amazing is on my journey, as I begin to look through these new pair of glasses through the Hebraic perspective of the author, when you go back and interpret Romans 7, what Paul is saying is that I want to desperately keep the law of God, but I can't. At the end of the chapter, it says, with my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, and in my heart, I'm a slave to sin. What a wretched man that I am. He wants to keep the law of God. The very person, the very apostle that we accuse of getting rid of God's law is the very person that wants to keep it. Do we see a problem with that? The problem is, is that he's finding himself constantly a war with the flesh, the spirit and the flesh. He's trying his best to keep it, but he's forgiven. Now remember, the very, last, or very first verse in, in Romans chapter 8 should be the last verse in Romans 7 because it says this, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that an incredible thing? Is that we are condemned by the, by the law, we are cursed and we should be hung on a tree, but the Messiah took that curse upon us, died for us so that we could be free from the curse, not free from the law, free from the penalty that it gives. So here's a couple million dollar questions here. Number one, if we are not to keep the law of God, then why does virtually every author of the scriptures, including James, John, Paul, and Jesus, tell us to keep the commandments? Remember Jesus. And, and Matthew, the, the rich young ruler, comes to him and says, uh, how do I enter into uh, eternal life? And Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. Well, we're more familiar with the second part of that, which says that go and sell everything you own. He says, well, I did that. Well, we forget that Jesus actually told him, Yeshua said, go and keep the commandments. Did he only mean that for a couple of months until he died? Or was he telling him an eternal principle? Was he telling him an eternal principle that would last forever? You see, that rich young ruler was not going to die. He was going to live for many years past that. Yeshua was giving him the principles for life. He says, you've been taught that the way, the truth, and life is the commandments themselves. He says, I submit to you that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That if you pair the written commandments with the spirit of what I'm telling you of who I am, you will have eternal life. 
You see, there's a reason why in Revelation, in the end days, the beast goes after those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. Our million dollar question number two. If the law of God is done away with, which we've all been told, and the definition of sin is breaking the law of God, 1 John 3, 4, then how can there be such a thing as sin? How can there be any possibility that, there, that sin even exists if we're not under the law of God, if there is no law of God? And last but not least, number three, how can there possibly be such a thing as judgment day if there's no standard of law to judge by? How can anyone be thrown into the lake of fire for breaking the law if they were not subject to, to begin with? The logic is a circular reasoning that breaks down in so many places. Uh, as we begin to look at this, you'll begin to see that. If you have no law, you have no sin. If you have no sin, you have no curse. Either the law still exists and condemns people for breaking it, and the Savior is needed to pay the penalty, or it doesn't exist and we don't need a Savior. Think about what we're saying. The law doesn't exist anymore for today. It's been nailed to the cross. It's been done away with. It's been abolished. We're under a new covenant. We're under grace. Well, if that's the case, my friends, then here's what we have. We have a situation where there is no law, which means there is no definition of sin, which means that there, it, the law cannot condemn anyone. There's no curse, which means we don't need a Savior to take the curse upon us, and we're all still uh, dead in our sins. We don't need a Savior. And how on earth can God, how can Yahweh have a judgment day and throw people into a hell for breaking something that we say doesn't exist? Why should we even go tell people about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua? Why should we even tell them that they need a Savior when our very core of our beliefs says that they're not under a curse? There's no transgression because we believe that the law has been done away with. The only laws that exist, we say, are those found or reiterated in the New Testament. And my friends, the logic is faulty on several points. We have no New Testament when these are written. So when they give us the gospel, when the writers of the New Testament give us the very gospel that we share with people, they're telling their people that they need a Savior because they broke the law of God. And we're telling people that they need a Savior because they broke a law in the New Testament. Ever so slightly different, but critical outcome, critical conclusion. Because how we live our life is directly attached to how we define this very definition. We know that the law condemns and curses all mankind for breaking it. Yeshua became the curse for us and paid our penalty for breaking the law, which is death. The law was the problem. This is what we're saying. The law was the problem, so he nailed the law to the cross, and no one has to keep it anymore, even though Hebrews says that he found fault with them. He didn't find fault with the law. Remember, Timothy tells us that the law of God is perfect. It says it's perfect and holy, and it's worthy for all doctrine, for all reproof and correction and a way of righteousness. So now that there is no law, this is what we say, there can be no curse either, which means there is no longer a need for a Savior to save us from our sins because there's no such thing as sin anymore because sin is a transgression of God's law. So to solve this problem, we as Christians have said that the only commandments that we need to keep are found in the New Testament. Even when the New Testament writers told us to keep the commandments of God, there was no New Testament. And you know what? It's a good thing that we're under grace because we need it, my friends. We need it. For we have been deceived by the enemy that it wasn't just the high priesthood and sacrificial system that was changed or fulfilled, I should say, but that the whole thing needed to be thrown out. See, here's another thought. If the law of God has been done away with as we've been, we've been told, we've all grown up believing, then that means the sacrificial system has been done away with. Let me shock you for a moment. The sacrificial system has never been done away with. Now you may say, oh Jim, you are really off, off the deep end. No, think about it. Yeshua, Jesus, became our high priest. 
If the sacrificial blueprints have been done away with, then we don't need a high priest. There can't be a high priest. One doesn't exist. You see, the sacrificial system does exist. Messiah is our high priest for the very reason that the sacrificial system exists. Blood still is required because we broke the law. The difference is, is he became, he fulfilled the sacrificial system once and for all. He became the sacrifice for all sacrifices. It doesn't mean that the blueprint is done away with. It means that the animal sacrifice itself has been fulfilled in the Messiah. Here's the amazing fact. Not only has God's law been done away with, as the enemy taught us that the law of God has been done away with, the enemy has absolutely taught us or helped us swallow that it was God's idea, that it was actually God's idea to get rid of his own law, when his law is, taught, is, is, is actually his son. The son of God is the law of God. It's the word made flesh. Certainly, God wouldn't get rid of his own son. Sin is the transgression of the law. Without the law, there's nothing to transgress. Without a transgression, there is no sin. Without sin, there is no Yeshua. So is the law bad or is it good? Romans 7.12 says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Why would Yahweh get rid of something that is holy and good? Let me ask you a question. Does your belief system say that the law is holy and good or that it's evil, it's bondage, it's man-made, and it needs to be done away with? And we're going to end at the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and it reads this. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which Yahweh had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. And here's what happened. Here's a detail. Here's the bullet points. God gave them a law. Number two, the serpent told them that he didn't really mean it. God gave us a law. We teach that he really didn't mean it. Are we sure we haven't been deceived twice? My friends, this is a critical issue. If we define sin any other way than breaking the commandments of God, if we define sin as breaking the commandments of God, uh, as not breaking the commandments of God, then we're going to find ourselves in the same situation as in the garden where the serpent is tricking us over and over and over again. Now, I understand and I will admit that there are a lot of difficult verses that, have to go, that we have to work through. And the third part in this series is actually the difficult sayings of Paul. It's the 25 some odd verses in the scriptures that seem to say that Paul is saying that the law of God is done away with. But the truth is, is that as you begin to put the Hebraic glasses that Paul had on, you'll see, just like we talked about in Romans, where it says that, the, that we're not under the law, we're under grace, that now you understand that it doesn't mean that we're not, we don't have to keep it. It means that we're not under the penalty of it anymore. And there are so many verses like that, like the one in Galatians that says that the law was unto Christ. No, it means that the law's authority is unto the Messiah. And now there's a new sheriff in town. The, the law still exists. The, the father doesn't come home and shoot the tutor. The tutor's still there. But he has no authority when the father's in the house. And so that's where we're at today, my friends. We need to define sin exactly the way the scriptures tell us to define it and no more. If we work to the left, if we walk to the, life, to the right, if we add or take away from this word, my friends, we are cursed. And so I ask you today to open your mind and work through the next part of this series, which is what is the new covenant? Because we're going to take this whole definition, we're going to put it right into the, 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 uh, the series of the definition of what the new covenant is. And as we walk out of exactly what the new covenant is, we'll have a belief system that the disciples had that we can walk and power will come. And I'll leave you with this thought. The Father says that he is looking for those who will do one thing. Worship him in spirit and in truth. I submit to you that now is the time. 
Today is the day that we get rid of the, tr the traditions and the doctrines of men that we audit our belief system, that we audit every doctrine. We tell every other religious cult that they need to audit theirs. Now is the time that we audit ours because we are the bride of Christ and the groom is coming back and he is ready and waiting and he is coming back for a bride that is without spot or wrinkle. Please this day join with me to follow the Messiah exactly the way that he and his followers did in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to just dig into your word, to dig into your scriptures, to define things the way that you define them. Your word tells us, Father, that if we would just follow you and trust you, that you would lead us into all the truth. And that truth only does one thing. It sets us free. Father, open up our hearts, open up our minds to receive this word, regardless of how it feels. I pray, Father, that we would walk into it, that you bring power into your people once again. You prepare your bride for your return. We thank you for all that you're doing, all that you're going to continue to do in your great son's name. I surrender to the king. Singing a song of praise. I surrender to the King.